the work that you've then been doing, well, I say work, the, the ministry, the podcast, the fun mm -hmm. you've been having with Holy Smokes, this incredible lineup of guests. Before the show you mentioned, you just punched in, was it 75 episodes, which is incredible. Yeah. And uh, what you've then, what we've done is <clears throat> we've, we've pulled together a selection of 13 of these interviews um, on a particular topic, uh, which was the, the Hebrew origins of Catholicism. Can you unpack that? And, and why, why is there a course? What, what was the reason for putting this together? Yeah. So, um, the podcast started in 2020, July, and I have to credit my wife for putting the fire under me to inspire me to do it because she always said, you need to write a book, you need to do a blog or something. But she said, you know, why don't you do a podcast because you love listening to them uh, mm -hmm. almost every day. She said, why don't you take a crack at it? And I kind of hemmed and hawed and she said, you know, I'm going to I'm gonna get your old music recording equipment from the basement. I'm going to set up the garage and you're doing this. And so <laughs> that very awesome. day was my wow. first episode uh, where I recounted my conversion story uh, wow. in greater detail. Episode one holy smokes we're now at 77 so if anyone wants a fuller account they can check episode one uh, on my channel mm -hmm. but uh yeah the crux of me starting the podcast was precisely that i wanted to show how the catholic church is the restoration and fulfillment of the first temple in jerusalem why that's significant and why that needs to be uh told far and wide to catholics and the broader world mm -hmm. is because well, there are a couple of reasons. Catholicism is often assumed to be this mixture between Greco-Roman paganism mm -hmm. and uh, rather simplistic, pure and simple Jewish messianic faith, which later right. got corrupted by Constantine or, you know, insert your boogeyman here. Mm -hmm. So that's a, that's a major one. Uh, another, another less nefarious view is that Christianity developed out of Rabbinic Judaism and Second Temple Judaism. Mm -hmm. But that implies that Christianity is Johnny come lately to the scene. Whichever way you slice it, mm -hmm. it can't really be said to be uh, truly original, right? Mm -hmm. if, if Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, then we should expect to find his way, his path, um, Extending all back scripture. throughout exactly throughout all history time. times, yes. yes, and and meta history, you know, mm -hmm. like it should be something eternal, not something that comes after the quote unquote pure and pristine faith of the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. um, and once we grab hold of this, we can we can challenge people and say, look, Catholicism is thoroughly biblical, maybe a lot more than you've even be, been led to believe. It's certainly not pagan. Everything from the queenship of Mary to the Eucharist to the papacy, all these things can be traced back to the Solomonic Temple and the Davidic Covenant, which is, in terms of covenant theology in the Bible and the different covenants, the, the covenant with David mm -hmm. is the everlasting covenant, the covenant of peace. And bound up with that is a certain priesthood, right? But mm -hmm. not the Aaronic, not the Levitical priesthood, but the Melchizedekian priesthood. Psalm 104 says... Uh, God speaking to David, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And we see this quoted again in Hebrews, speaking of Christ. So Christ is in, the, in that same priesthood as David. So mm -hmm. David's covenant is everlasting. And here comes Christ to both uh, re-inaugurate, not invent out of whole cloth, cloth but re-inaugurate and eventually, ultimately, fulfill through his person, through the work that he's done redemptively, and through his his mystical body, the church, which, which is his incarnation extended into time and space, which continues his work until he returns again. Mm -hmm. So utterly fundamentally important and understudied, underappreciated. So yeah. I felt that God had given me a mission to unpack this and share it with, with, with Catholics and non-Catholics, obviously. Absolutely. I mean, this contribution is so foundational. I mean, I'm thinking of some of the heavyweights in terms of, um, what do you call it? Uh, uh, scriptural research and exegesis. I mean, I'm thinking like Scott Hahn and his contributions, there's Jeff Cavins and his contributions to the Bible timeline. And then there's yeah. these insights from all the people that you've been interviewing, the books that you've been working with, and then the way that you've coalesced them and brought them together. And and really, I think this course is this distillation of your, 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 your journey and then your wrestling and all of your interviews. 
I have never seen uh, uh, from the little from what I've read out of Scott Hahn and Jeff Cavins and anywhere that you research uh, or go to read um, about the Old Testament, about the First Temple, about the roots of Christianity. They always extend back to some kind of mishmash of the Second Temple. And then what you're helping us to see is no, no, no. This is so much older. You help us actually, you know, with the research and the interviews, understand who is Melchizedek, who were the figures and the ornaments and the the symbolism, the living symbolism of that mm. first temple. What were the rituals? You know, right. not just that. You know, it's it's so often said Christianity is the the full flower. It's like the butterfly, and Judaism is the the caterpillar. And you know, up up to a point, that's true, but with the research that you've done and, and the way that, what this course now contributes to our Christian understanding of our origins is it's like going from, from one butterfly into an even clearer, uh, greater butterfly. And then you made this mm -hmm. one point. I wanted, I'd like to start wrapping and ask you to unpack this when Christ is then on his three year mission and he's saying all these things and all of his apostles are like, yep. Uh, -huh, uh, -huh. and all the Pharisees are just having, fit. Um, and then Mary comes along and everyone's like, oh yeah, of course, perfectly fine. And they had no problem with all these things. And you make the point and, and uh, that it's because it's all first temple theology. Uh, yeah. Finally, Christ is restoring it. And, and 2000 years later, we have no idea what, what he's actually talking about. Yeah. I mean, you know, the whole, like in the first temple, there was a cult surrounding the king. Uh, which the second temple didn't have it, it, it had lost that um, but the whole idea was very incarnational that the, the king was not just a sacral figure or a, um, a purely monarchical secular figure where he just ruled over a nation or a people um, the idea was that he was both priest and king and also the son of god most high and the son of the great lady and the great lady, you could say she had a, a you could say she had like a heavenly uh, aspect and an earthly counterpart. So the heavenly aspect, um, you could say, is the creation as a whole, as as feminine, as mm -hmm. receiving, as being receptive. Yes. And God, the masculine principle, the creative power, the active power coming to dwell in her on the macrocosmic level mm -hmm. and microcosmically we see that recapitulated in christ the god man dwelling in the feminine in the womb of his mother and having his priestly vestments woven out of mary's flesh with the help of the holy spirit so that now christ is our emmanuel god with us and in a similar way mm -hmm. in the first temple you had the high the Melchizedek high priest king mm -hmm. who was anointed with oil from the menorah. The menorah was a symbol of lady wisdom of the great lady. And so mm -hmm. anointing oil was taken from her, uh, placed on the king. And then he became, you could say in a sense, divinized. Mm -hmm. And one of his titles was uh, Emmanuel which sounds familiar to us Christians because that's the title of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And there is an episode in Chronicles where it says Solomon, Solomon sat on the throne of the Lord. And the English says, and the, pe the people worshipped uh, the people worshiped the Lord with the king, or the king and the people worshiped the Lord. But if, mm -hmm. according to uh, Margaret Barker's um, purview or survey of the Hebrew, it's the people worshiped God and the king as like a string um, mm -hmm. syntactically. We get the same thing in the book of Revelation where it says the throne of God and the lamb, but it's all one construction. So in the Hebrew here, it's mm -hmm. as Solomon sits on the throne of the Lord and is inaugurated. Um, it says the people worship God and the king. So in the temple, we have this figure who's anointed from the, from the lady, mm -hmm. who's divinized, and now becomes the, you could say, the cult statue of Yahweh, uh, son of the most high God, mm -hmm. in the temple, which represents creation. Amazing. And so we see that with Christ, mm -hmm. obviously, coming and dwelling in creation through the womb of his blessed mother. And you could say, in a sense, she anoints him with 
priestly garments of flesh. So we can say that there's the anointing of the lady with the incarnation, just as there was with the divinization of the Melchizedek priest king in the first temple. So I think that's why, uh, part of the reason why at least, the incarnation made so much sense uh, to, the, to the Christians right away. And also the cultic activities of the high priest who mm -hmm. wore, because you got to remember, Jesus both fulfills the Davidic kingdom as the Davidic king, but he also fulfills the Mosaic law in the Levitical high priesthood. So speaking on the, uh, the, Melchiz the, um, the Levitical high priestly aspect, the high priest, before he went into the Holy of Holies, wore two garments. He wore an outer vestment of purple and then an undergarment of uh, seamless white linen. Now, this is interesting because in the Garden of Eden, according to some of the church fathers, the garments that were woven for Adam and Eve after they sinned were not actual mm -hmm. animal skins, but garments of flesh. Mm -hmm. So before this, they had, they had garments of glory, mm -hmm. of divine light. And Adam and Eve are looked, well, obviously Adam is the priest of Eden. So there's this, you know, idea where the priest as God's vice regent dwells on earth. And this is God's icon and presence on earth. Mm -hmm. And when the high priest went into the Holy of Holies, he'd have two garments. He'd have the outer garment made of purple. And that purple was sort of symbolic of the weaving together of all the elements of creation, which would come together to create this royal purple blue color, mm -hmm. which is still Israel's national color today. And these, these outer vestments would conceal the white linen vestments. So the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies on Yom Kippur, make the sacrifice, sprinkle the blood, go into the Holy of Holies, mm -hmm. and emerge with his white linen garment. So we get this incarnational theology again, where Christ enters the world in flesh in an outer garment, which conceals his divinity, his his, if you like, his linen garment. Mm -hmm. And after he makes the sacrifice, he ascends in glory. And the disciples are given the picture of this at the, at the Mount of Transfiguration. So this is why the incarnation makes so much sense to the first mm -hmm. Christians. This is why Mary, as the icon of the lady, and the lady herself, the fulfillment of the lady, uh, this is why all this made sense so soon. Mm -hmm. And things like the, you know, the real presence in the Eucharist, uh, Margaret Barker makes this very clear point that this bread was not simply set out in the presence of God, but mm -hmm. God, this, this memorial offering was invoking the Lord upon the bread. And so the bread would impart holiness to those who ate it, namely the priests mm -hmm. and the Eucharist, of course, is the real presence of Christ, of God, of God and man. Mm -hmm. And so all these things made sense. The papacy, for example, um, we have this, the episode in Isaiah 22 where Shebna is the royal steward of the Davidic king and the, uh, the house of Judah, and he gets replaced by Eliakim. And Eliakim is given charge over the sacred vessels, uh, the Aramaic Targums, I believe, say he wore a turban and uh, he was girded. So he had um, a priestly status as well as, um, you could say, uh, secular over the kingdom, but he also had a priestly status. He was called Ab, father to the, inhabit uh, the, inhabit the inhabitants of Judah. Mm -hmm. And he was fastened as a secure peg. So we get that rock imagery where Peter, uh, Christ says to Peter, you are rock, and upon this rock I will build my church. And he is the royal vice regent of the king, the Davidic king, being Christ. Peter is that royal vice regent, and he has um, authority over the house, the people of God, the temple, and what he opens, none shall shut. What he shuts, none shall open. This is in Isaiah 22, uh, stated again in Matthew 16, in mm -hmm. a slightly different way, but binding and loosing, opening and shutting the doors of the temple. Same sort of imagery there. Mm -hmm. So this is why all this stuff made sense so early to the first mm -hmm. Christians. And we see it. We see it in the literature. We see it in the data.
Yeah. Yeah. This is incredible. Um, it's like this, uh, as we're digging into the actual history and the actual story, what we then find is um, there's the the flowering of God's work with the Hebrew peoples, with the first temple. But then there's this, this surprising detour uh, that then goes on to happen with the rise of the second temple. And as you pointed out, with rabbinic Judaism, and then Christ uh, emerges with a gospel and a message that is the restoration of that first temple. And then 2,000 years later, uh, we've we've kind of lost that plot, and we've only suddenly rediscovered um, all of these things that the, the Catholic Church gets up to. All of a sudden, we're rediscovering its origins and the meaning within the first temple and why they were so they were lost under the rabbinic judaism right and, and i did um, um I, I mentioned the sort of heavenly aspect of the lady i forgot to mention the earthly aspect uh, which is the gevi Ra, the great lady the consort of the king um mm -hmm. the davidic king and it was his mother mm -hmm. and it's interesting too because if you look at psalm 45 we have god speaking to solomon and he says your throne, O oh God, is forever. So he calls Solomon God. So the whole idea of the Davidic king being divinized is right there in Psalm 45 because he's called God in some sense. Mm -hmm. He's also the son, the son of God, and obviously the son of his mother, who is the queen at his right hand. Mm -hmm. So if you read Psalm 45, there's a beautiful exposition of that. And it says of the queen mother that all nations shall entreat you. It's interesting how that Amazing. gets fulfilled in Mary. And, uh, yeah. you know, the the Magnificat, when Mary says, all generations shall call me blessed, she did, that wasn't just a spontaneous fr phrase of praise right. and adulation of God, but it went back to Psalm 45, where mm -hmm. it, it is promised to the queen that all generations will praise her. So she has a self-awareness, mm -hmm. a self-understanding. Her son's the Davidic yeah. king. She knows that she's the Davidic queen. Incredible. So there you go, friends. If some of this conversation has wet your whistle and uh, you're somebody who enjoys understanding the, the, uh, the history, the origins of Christianity and of Catholicism, then this course is something that um, you're going to have a hard time putting down. Uh, you're probably going to want to follow along with the different conversations. Who are some of the people, Dustin, that you have on the podcast? Yeah. So podcast wise, um, it wouldn't be complete without Margaret Barker, of course, mm -hmm. uh, the foundress of temple theology as a discipline of study. So vitally important that I get her on. Mm -hmm. uh, we've actually become good friends over the years. I used to dialogue with her back when I was a quote unquote Christ eccentric uh, Muslim. Mm -hmm. And uh, her book, The Great Angel, A Study of Israel's Second God, was one of the things that really convinced me and showed me that you know the christians understanding jesus as yahweh what it meant and why it was received so early made so much sense mm -hmm. uh, that was big for me in my journey uh, i've had scott hahn i've had jimmy aiken tim staples john bergsma brant petrie um, michael lofton um, I've, I've had all kinds of people um, people well known and some lesser known but you know to me it's not all about big names it's about yeah. great contributions great conversations and people with an amazing story i have some some amazing conversion stories uh, on the podcast mm -hmm. as well which are worth checking out if you want to be edified so mm -hmm. uh yeah you know people i used to i used to sit and listen to and wonder gee i wonder what it would be like to sit and have a you know a whiskey with them or a cigar yeah. with them and it would just be like a fleeting dream. But now I actually can say I've done that and God mm -hmm. has blessed me to do that and look at the fruit that has been born because of it. Yeah. Uh, it's been an absolute joy to do this. So within uh, within this course, um, we'll just do a little bit of name dropping here. You have Dr. John Bergsma is in here on the Hebrew roots of the yep. church. Yep. Daniel Suazo, who has since uh, been uh, uh, entered into the church. He was um, uh, a Jew himself for, for a long time and discerning uh, conversion. There's this Margaret Barker several times, and uh, you wrap, at least so far, the course, uh, lesson number 12 wraps with Suan Sona. And what's so cool about the, the work that you're doing is the you're the, one of the only people that I know of who's having these discussions of temple theology in such a, a consistent and in, you know, attentive way 
to discuss all of this within the context of, of Catholicism. The Mormons are having these discussions. I see uh, some Protestants online are, are starting to you know wrestle with these and have these discussions. Within the Catholic space, nobody yet knows about it or maybe what to do with it. And you're charging right down the middle and bringing this all together. Um, well, yeah. It, 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 the funny thing is, you know, you see Mormons try to grab hold of it and they try to, you know, squeeze their idea of theosis and project it back onto the, to the fathers, for example. Mm -hmm. But Catholicism, and this should be no surprise, as the fullness of truth mm -hmm. contains all the pieces. Mm -hmm. It accounts for everything. So Mormons might have an idea of theosis, but do they have the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist? The Eucharist? Do they have the uh, the royal vizier, or the royal steward of the house of David? No, not even the Orthodox have that crucial piece missing. And it's funny because Margaret Barker told me once off camera when, when we were didn't we didn't yet go live or start recording, mm -hmm. she conceded to me and admitted that the papacy goes back to the first temple. Uh, citing Isaiah 22. Wow. So okay. only Catholicism possesses the fullness of truth and the and the full deposit of the faith. And it all goes back to the temple. So if you were to pick, as we close off here, if you were to pick the number one reason uh, why you think uh, a Catholic should, or even non-Catholic maybe, should, should take up the challenge of this course and discover with you the, the Hebrew origins of Catholicism, what would be the number one reason? Uh, you'd like to leave with people well the number one reason i mean the whole the you know the 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 religion and the cult surrounding the tabernacle and the temple was directly revealed by god it's god ordained and for catholicism to to be the fulfillment of it all shows and established no less by god incarnate it shows that our faith truly is divine it truly is of god so, at the, you know, it's nice to talk about all these connections and all of it's important and it points to a trajectory and a conclusion, but the, con the conclusion is what is most important, namely that our faith is divine. It is divine truth and the church is established for our salvation, for our theosis, for our deification. Um, and all are invited into our arms and it is our hope that through this material, that more and more people, those outside the church would flock to her, knowing the power and the magnitude of all these truths, and be convinced by them, hopefully by the stirring of the Spirit. And those who are already within her bounds, her visible bounds, would have a greater appreciation for the origins of our faith, and be able to defend it against attacks that it's a, a mishmash of quote-unquote Judaism and Greco-Roman paganism. I want them to, to be like St. Paul in Romans, who says that this is, you know, the Abrahamic, this is the religion of Abraham, the Abrahamic covenant. And it's funny because Islam makes the same claim. It's the, the religion of Abraham. Mm -hmm. But the religion of Abraham actually goes back to Melchizedek uh, and the offering of bread and wine. Yes. Islam doesn't have that. So uh, you can be able to not only be sure in your faith, and confident in it, but also defended against false charges and attacked. And as we know, the church is constantly being attacked, both from sadly within and from without. And we have to rediscover or discover for the first time mm -hmm. the joy and beauty of what we actually possess. And I, I think through that, mm -hmm. our experience and understanding of the sacraments, you know, the temple roots of baptism, of confirmation, the holy anointing oil, which anointed the high priest, uh, the Eucharist being the bread of the presence, uh, the church being the temple, and uh, us being all partakers and participa participants in the priesthood of Christ, the Melchizedek priesthood of Christ as priest, prophet, and king by virtue of our baptism. All these things will come alive and will jump out at you, and you'll never experience the, sacra the sacraments or the liturgy the same again once you let this seep and soak into your being. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's what a, I would say. That's a perfect, perfect way to put it. I mean, discovering it and working through this stuff has, it's brought not only a sense of joy, I think it's a great word, um, but also a sense of feeling like I'm, I'm learning my faith for the first time. Or I'm learning yes. the story of how it all fits together for the first time. So friends, if you, if you, uh, 
enjoyed this this interview. It's really just a beginning uh, taste. Come and join Dustin in his brand new course, The Hebrew Origins uh, of Catholicism. You can find it in Smart Catholics. It's available as a free course. Just visit us, smartcatholics.com. Come in, create a free profile. Hit the courses link. You'll see all the courses available. Uh, this is one that is going to be in there. Dustin, it was wonderful to have you with us. Thanks for coming back, my friend. Thank you, my dear brother. And uh, thank you for all the work that you're doing. And may the Lord bless it and multiply it and make it fruitful.